Welcome to this Haymarket Books tribute to the wonderful and brilliant Mike Davis. Uh, we're so glad you could tune in this evening, and we're so honored to have here with us Jerry Silva and Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and also a video tribute from Angela Davis. Uh, and we're going to begin our program this evening with words uh, about Mike Davis from Angela Davis. It is a major honor to be able to contribute to this conversation on the life and work of our beloved Mike Davis. I want to convey my love and heartfelt condolences to his wife, Alessandra, and to his children. And I am so, so sorry that my contribution is in the form of a recorded message as I am currently on an airplane. So I'm sending my love and comradely greetings to Ruthie, Jerry, Anthony, and other participants in this program. For many of us, the death of Mike Davis has set things off kilter. Mike was the guide who helped us to contend with what might otherwise be completely incomprehensible. We looked to Mike as the one who could reliably persuade us that love was the glue that bound us together into a force powerful enough to imagine and indeed also to forge possibilities for habitable futures. I know that Mike confessed on several occasions that he had always wanted to die on the battlefield or on the barricades, and that sadly, this was not the way he was going out. But I know that I am not the only one who would say that the many battles he fought and encouraged up until his death were more than enough to count for multiple lifetimes. He clearly went out demonstrating to us how to keep on fighting on behalf of immigrants, workers, people of color, Palestinian justice, Kurdish women, and on behalf of all those who yearn for the socialist futures, humans, and all living things on this planet deserve. Mike Davis always made sure that we understood the stakes of our struggle, what we were fighting for, and with whom we were waging our battles. Whether he was writing about architecture, environmental devastation, pandemics, prisons, or any of the vast number of subjects he explored, he always taught us to look for the contours and internal structures that revealed mm -hmm. the presence of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mike taught us never to take capitalism for granted and never to forget that the future of capitalism was precisely dependent on our imbibing the ideology of capitalism's ahistoricity. His was one of those persistent voices that called upon people to stop assuming that racism, patriarchy, and poverty was simply a matter of choice or happenstance, that increasingly large numbers of people began to take seriously the structural character of racism and xenophobia was in part attributable to Mike's persistent teachings and the strategic ways they circulated. At the beginning of the pandemic, he told us that the coronavirus crisis was a monster fueled by capitalism. 
and I quote him here, the current pandemic expands the argument. Capitalist globalization now appears biologically unsustainable in the absence of a truly international public health infrastructure. But, he said, such an infrastructure will never exist until people's movements break the power of big pharma and for-profit healthcare. He said this at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was not accidental, I think, that for the first time, systems and institutions and structures began to define popular ways of thinking about the racism directed against indigenous, Latinx, and Black and Asian American people. These insights emerged precisely as we were catching up with Mike's analysis and the way he always framed these issues. I'm sure that Ruthie will agree that even as we acknowledge Cedric Robinson's pivotal notion of racial capitalism, we are likewise deeply indebted for Mike's tenacious insistence on the way capitalism has structured racism and vice versa. As two of the co-organizers of the Critical Resistance Conference that took place in 1998, Ruthie and I can certainly attest to the fact that Mike's ideas and interventions constituted the grounding of critical resistance. First of all, when we read his piece in The Nation, Hell Factories in the Field, a prison industrial complex, uh, we realized the potential of reframing what came eventually to be called mass incarceration in relation to the restructuring of economies related to the rising globalization of capital in the 1980s. I don't think that Ruthie or I will ever forget the way Mike dramatized what we were calling the prison crisis. The crisis precipitated by the proliferation of prisons throughout California's rural areas. Of course, Ruthie writes about this crisis at length in her brilliant and now classic Golden Gulag, Prison Surplus Crisis and Opposition in Globalizing California. Mike was one of the plenary speakers at this first uh, CR conference, the first conference of critical resistance. He had brought with him a huge chunk of concrete, which he said had come from his driveway and was ultimately destined for a landfill. But he had brought this chunk of concrete with him to make the point that this was the material being used to construct prisons, which he called human landfills, to construct prisons, these human landfills all over the state. He emphatically told the audience that each prison was a school or a hospital that would never be built. Prisons, he said, were more of a hazard in California than even the San Andreas Fault. And he said that no society since Nazi Germany had built so many prisons within such a short period of time. Prisons in California, what he then called the Gulag Archipelago, constituted, he argued, the greatest bipartisan public works program built by what he called spineless Democrats as much as it was built by conservative Republicans. 
the concluding question of his presentation that evening in 1998 was something like this. Um, what do you need to break these gray concrete walls? You need a hammer. And Mike's final words were, and you are that hammer. I cannot tell you how many times those words have reverberated in my mind over the last couple of decades. You are that hammer. Abolition was the theme of our conference, but Mike made it real. He made it concrete. <laughs> Excuse me. He also made us understand that it was not simply a question of breaking up concrete buildings. It was, of course, a question of concrete, but not only concrete buildings, but it was also a question of an analysis grounded concretely in the conditions produced by the global capitalism of the latter 20th century that led to the privatization of healthcare, further privatization of, of education, increased commoditization of social necessities, uh, subordinating, subordinating almost everything to the pressures of profit. In this sense, the chunk of concrete Mike brought to the conference served as a metaphor for his thoroughgoing materialism. Mike always emphasized how important it was to organize people's movements, that this was the ingredient of history that could throw a wrench into the machine. It is interesting that he was so frequently referred to as a prophet of doom, but I think he contested that description because he was attempting to reveal through his research and analysis as realistic an assessment of where we were headed as possible. Only by boldly demonstrating the possible consequences of life lived in accordance with the racial capitalist demand for hierarchy and exploitation in exchange for profit, might it be possible to begin to reverse that trajectory. The ecology of fear was not written to scare us into inaction, but rather to spur us toward organizing precisely to stave off or at least attenuate these possible consequences. I cannot imagine the future course of our organizing against environmental justice and defense of unionization against war for abolition in solidarity with women in Iran in support of a radical democratic trajectory in Brazil and Colombia against structural racism and heteropatriarchy. I cannot imagine this organizing without the assistance of Mike Davis's bold and radical analyses. He will always be there on the barricades, reminding us that we are the hammer and that we are the dreamers. Mike Ryan Davis, presente. Thank you so much for that, Angela. I now want to bring in Jerry Silva, who was born and raised in Los Angeles and has spent the last 40 years in all forms of struggle for human, political, and economic rights. Her activity covers the span from immigration rights to welfare rights to the right to decent housing for all in need. For the past 20 plus years, she has fought against the rampant and ongoing abuses in the courts and at the hands of the police. She's a founding member of Mothers Reclaiming Our Children, founded in 1992, 
Families to Amend California's Three Strikes in 1996, The Fair Chance Project in 2009, California Families Against Solitary Confinement in 2011, and Families United to End Life Without Parole in 2017. And Mike Davis and his co-author John Wiener dedicated their book, Set the Night on Fire, to Jerry. Thank you, Jerry, for joining us tonight. Oh, it's such an honor to be asked to join and, and to know that Mike wanted this. I, what Angela just said was so moving and just so correct. He is, he is an ever present. As the days go by, I, you know, and I think of him, I feel sadder and sadder to know that he isn't here with his sharp, critical um, outlook and way of looking at things. And we don't have that. Ruthie, step up to the plate, girl. Um, I don't even remember when I met Mike. I know it was very soon after writing um, City of Quartz. But I just don't remember. I don't even know how, except he used to come to the Midnight Special Bookstore, which is um, a pretty renowned bookstore in Santa Monica. But people came from all over the world, literally, to read their books. And I'm I'm sure that he read, um, he did a book discussion of City of Courts, and that might be where I met him. Uh, but it was very soon after the publication of the book. And what struck me is that I, I was an organizer, I am an organizer, but I am not um, on the level of, you know, intellect, et cetera, that he and Angela and, and Ruthie are. But that didn't matter to him because what he saw in me was a fighting spirit. And that's what he united with. And he, like, like Ruthie, he wasn't just an intellect who wrote books. That's what I loved about Mike. He joined us in, in what we were doing at the time, especially after the uprising in 92. Um, he went with me to the home of Georgiana Williams. And she was the mother of one of the four men who were uh, being prosecuted for beating Reginald Denny. Um, we went there to talk to her, to talk to her other son, and to talk about writing an article for a paper called the People's Tribune. He actually allowed me to co-author an article for the People's Tribune, which is like, I think of now co-author, I think I had one line in there, but we had such a good discussion with Georgiana and there was nothing that separated Mike from Georgiana. He, he, he wasn't, he was at every, at the level of anybody that he was with. He, he, um, would hold, I mean, I met a lot of people through Mike because he would hold meetings at his house and he'd invite just a vast array of different people. Um, Jerry Brown, Rodney King, I, Tom Hayden, all kinds of people that whose names aren't known, but who are also like active in, in different and various ways. Um, so I, I met a lot of people. He always gave me the utmost respect. And I want to mention that um, Ruthie talks a lot about Mother's Rock, and you mention it now in her book. Um, Mike is, all, is kind of partially responsible for the founding of that organization. Uh, we, we were talking um, one day, Mike, uh, Teresa Allison, who was a co-founder of Mother's Rock and myself, about all these young black men that were going from the streets, snatched up by the police, through the courts to prison, totally unaware of what was really going on, right? Um, and he pointed out, talked to us about South America that disappeared and made us see the connection between what's happening in the streets of South Central and every, any inner city and what was going on there and that the mothers organized organized to reclaim the disappeared, to make it known what was happening to them. So in many ways, he, he was responsible for its founding. And I think Mother's Rock was a reflection of 
Ruthie, as, as well as Mike, um, understanding that people in communities don't know what's going on. They, they never went to legalese school, so they don't know when they go to court what's happening. All they hear is that they are being demeaned and that the young men are looked on as demons. They're fully demonized them. And we decided that had to change. We had to go to the courtroom, be there, be a presence, um, and let the, the jury know and the, you know, everybody else there know. But we were there. We saw what was going on and we weren't ignorant. We did understand that. And that made a lot of difference to the mothers. And it's not like we went to, I think we were kind of the precursors. Um, well, I think so anyway, to um, participatory defense, which I believe is going on all over the country, because we, I feel like we're the first court watching group and it made a difference. It made a huge difference. And I really count him as being pretty responsible for being a part of that. Um, Another memory I have of Mike, and this is just a very, a very sweet one and dear one to me that I will never forget. When the midnight special was going to close its doors, the, there was a party one night. It was, I think it was in 2003 at the store and everybody came. Every, all the writers, everybody that was in and around LA, you weren't there though, Ruthie, I don't think. But so of course Mike was there and I was so sad to see that bookstore go. That bookstore introduced me to Marx, introduced me to a way of thinking that changed my the trajectory of my life. I was always going to be an organizer, but now I was an informed one. So I was sitting in the hall in the back part of the bookstore just crying. And he came and he put his hand on my shoulder and he told me, he said, Jerry, you, you are one of my favorite activist organizers or my favorite. And that just, I, I couldn't believe it. I probably cried more. But to hear that from somebody like him who knew a lot of people, I wasn't the only activist he knew or the only organizer he knew. And that just, that kind of solidified for me what kind of person he is. He's all that and he's an empathetic, very human person. So I, obviously I got to know him on a personal level, and, and that was wonderful for me. I just loved that part of Mike. Being went out to eat with him, and you know, went to clubs with him. I'm sorry. Um, and and so I got to know him in a real personal way, and that that really really meant a lot to me. I I don't you know, there's a lot to say, but a lot of it's just on a personal level. But I just will say that. Inter interacting with Mike and and reading after, you know, in the 80s, I was very involved in, in organizing people around police killings in South Central, very, very, very much so, and everything that was going on, the battering ram and all that. So when the City of Courts came, the book came out, I rushed to read that chapter, uh, what is it, Between a Hammer and a Rock or something? And I read in that all the conditions and everything that was going on. It was like, this man is so smart. He's not at all removed. He knows everything that went down. You know, he studied. And, you know, he was kind of like a part of it. After um, a murder took place in Imperial Courts, a police murder, a year after the murder took place, they had a memorial uh, for the individual, Henry Pico. And Mike went with me. To that memorial, he 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 just did not separate himself. Or oop, I can't go there. I'm a white man. He went everywhere, and he was part of everything. And I will definitely miss him very much. And I my I'm honored. My heart goes out to his closest family, his wife and his children, and everybody that loved him. And I would have to end like Angela did. Mike Davis present day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. So glad that you could be with us today. I know it really meant a lot to Mike that you were going to be part of this. Uh, and also, he was so deeply moved that you could be with us. Ruthie, Ruth Wilson Gilmore is a co-founder of many organizations, including the California Prison Moratorium Project, 
Critical Resistance and the Central California Environmental Justice Network and is Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at CUNY Graduate Center. She's the author of Golden Gulag, which we've been talking about this evening. Her newest book published by Verso is Abolition Geography, Essays Towards Liberation, and her book Change Everything, Racial Capitalism and the Case for Abolition is forthcoming from Haymarket Books. I'll turn it over to you now, Ruthie. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Angela, wherever you are in the plane. And um, thank you, John, and everyone who's made this um, gathering possible. I, like everyone, am incredibly moved to be part of this conversation and this memorial. And I'll just start. Um, uh, the writer, An Anita Desai, uh, gave an interview some years ago at some writer's conference. and. And the interviewer, uh, who was very sympathetic, asked uh, Desai, "Well, how do you how do you develop the ideas for your novels? You know, what do you do? How do you decide what you're going to write?" And she said, "Well, I keep notebooks, and I just write things and write things, and I go back and I read my notebooks, and after a while, I start to notice what fragments belong to one another." And I found that such an incredibly touching, moving way to think about becoming a writer, but also becoming an organizer and becoming a teacher, and even this event, that we are fragments in a way that belong to one another, including through our love of and comradeship and learning and solidarity and struggle with Mike Davis, with whom we learned to fight like hell. I first met Mike at his 40th birthday party festivities in 1986. A partner that my partner, a party that my partner Craig Gilmore and I sort of crashed because we were in the car with our friends Dozier Hammond and Jane Sloan, and we had just been to a demonstration in solidarity with the people of El, El Salvador. And Dozier said, Hey, let's go to this party at Bob Brenner's house. And we didn't know Bob Brenner, and we actually had never met Mike Davis, but we said, Why not? It's a party. <laughs> Off we went. So we got to the party and there was a great big cake, you know, milestone birthday, age 40. And after we'd sung and he'd blown out the candles, Mike realized that Dozier's birthday was fast approaching. So with characteristic generosity, he led us all in a second round of happy birthday on behalf of his comrade, Dozier. Now as members of the Lumpen Professoriat, Adjunct Professor Davis and Adjunct Professor Gilmore's paths crossed all sorts of places over time. I mean, in the 80s, I was just a dropout. I wasn't a professor or anything. I was just doing organizing and things. But starting in the 90s, I did start teaching. And our paths crossed, including as Matt Garcia reminisced recently in the Los Angeles Review of Books, in a reading group seminar based in Claremont, that wasn't so much convened by Mike as drawn together by him, like his magnetic field. Like we couldn't resist going to this, this, this reading group or seminar. So together we tried to make sense of the tumultuous times at the end of the eighties and the beginning of the nineties. You know, the times when the Berlin wall came down and Mandela was still in prison, but maybe he was gonna get out of prison and structural adjustment was, was spanning the globe well into its second decade, you know, churning and churning the organized abandonment that characterizes capitalism, saving capitalism from capitalism. And in the context of this, were the early realizations of what Jerry was talking about and Angela has already spoken of, which is to say breathtaking prison growth. What one California state analyst called the biggest prison building project in the history of the world. So the cops were out of control. Jerry's already talked about Rodney King's beating in 1991, the Los Angeles uprising in 1992. All of these things were in the air and while not all of the events had yet come to pass, they were coming. So we not only read together in this group or, sem or seminar that Mike convened, we also watched movies. For example, on a very kind of hazy little black and white TV, we watched a no doubt bootleg copy 
of Charles Burnett's amazing film, The Killer's Sheep. And Mike extemporized an incredible lecture about the Black working class in Los Angeles and how we could understand that film as an elegy to something that was already passing rather than uh, some kind of sociological um, presentation of a current situation. It was just gorgeous. And we thought about with him how we think about what we see. Mike's remarkable ability to shape a narrative is one of the features of his remarkable work that everybody comments on for good reason. As he said of himself during one of his last interviews, Mike Davis was a damn good storyteller. Yeah. So he was. He was also a fantastic orator, as we learned listening to Angela's luminous portrayal of his astonishing opening plenary talk at the 1998 Critical Resistance Conference. The first time I spoke at a conference with, um, with Mike, uh, it was one convened by Karen Brodkin at UCLA, probably in 1991, and probably the topic was the first Gulf War. Um, Karen organized it conveniently, conveniently on a day that I was there. I adjuncted 55 miles each way to and from work um, and taught two courses uh, a week. So all of the conference presenters and the audience had crowded into a classroom. Mike wasn't there yet. But as everybody knows, time, tide, and university room scheduling wait for no lighters. <laughs> so we each had our say. And just as Karen was about to open for question and answer, Mike arrived at the door with, I can't think of a better word, with an entourage. The room was too packed for them to make it up to the front. And I suspected from Mike's body language, he wasn't about to abandon anyone he'd arrived with out in the hall. So he stood in the doorway, arms crossed across his chest, and spoke in full paragraphs with topic sentences about what, as he said in his conclusion, was, quote, burdening my heart today. Burdening my heart today. That eloquence caught us all, whether off guard or poised to leap into his thought. And I had immediately a fresh sense of what this work we do talking with one another can be, not as demagoguery, but as convivial moments in the constant churn of crisis out of or through which there is always another way, many other ways to fight. What, you might ask, was so convivial about a speaker turning up late to an event? He turned up with a crowd and stayed with them while talking with the crowd already assembled and he did it seriously. That double articulation, pardon my jargon, flexibly connecting and forcibly expressing, that double articulation, as many people, most notably Stuart Hall, make dynamic in their work, showed out as the ongoing drama of changing everything in that small moment in Mike Davis's enormous repertoire. He was, in other words, always rehearsing in the sense of Brechtian epic theater, where the performance is a moment in the rehearsal, not the end, and only matters when, for the spectator, reader, listener, what is possible is first made possible. For Brecht, that was what art could do. Mike brought his narrative and oratorical passions toward emphasizing this possibility. Angela agreed in her remarks that the ascription to Mike, prophet of doom, not only sat ill in his view of what the work was for and about, it also misses the point of figuring the dramatic possibilities in hearing in a particular historical geographic moment, whether it's South Central LA or Kurdistan or wherever else his amazingly capacious mind turned his analytical and research skills. But also, I will add, as Raymond Williams pointed out 40 years ago about the domestication of Bertolt Brecht, calling him a prophet of doom shrivels 
Mike's astonishing intellectual, social, and political work to some tough talk or doom talk, as though a sliver of tone were the entire accomplishment, rather than persistent notes on life in rehearsal they call us, as actator, actor spectators, to the process of making the world we want, which is the world we need. Through Mike, I met Jerry, whose sister Margie I already knew from running with radical booksellers like Dozier Hammond and Craig Gilmore, radical booksellers of whom I fancied myself head because usually the only groupie. Many publishers and editors deeply shifted my consciousness and sense of strategy and purpose back in the 80s and into the early 90s including Barbara Smith, Kasuhun Chakol, Haki Madabudi, Norma Alarcon, Glenn Thompson, Colin Robinson, and houses such as City Lights, Monthly Review, South End, Anthony Arnov, Tanya McKinnon, as well as the remarkable editors at Legacy, Trade Houses, and University Presses. Mike turned his organizational talent and political imagination to the printed page, not only as writer, but also as an editor at Verso, the Haymarket series he and Mike Sprinker launched, as well as indefatigably recommending budding writers to busy editors, handing them manuscripts and saying, read this now. That's how a 1997 dissertation awkwardly titled From Military Keynesianism to Post-Keynesian Militarism eventually became Golden Gulag published by the University of California Press under the persistent and patient editorial care of Linda Norton, Mon Monica McCormick, and Niels Hoop. In September of 1998, Alessandra Moctezuma and Mike Davis and half a dozen others piled into our house for the weekend of the CR, excuse me, Critical Resistance Conference. Mike demanded and read my dissertation, ink barely dry, and we talked about everything after he characteristically read it in a single sitting. He was known for his total absorption. For example, he would not stand up from his writing machine until he finished a section of the book he was writing for his boy Jack years ago. Wouldn't get up until he finished the section. That dissertation's development benefited most from Mike's generosity in sharing research and stories debating analysis, finding something there that might have seemed on the surface different from what was actually dynamically in play on the ground. In particular, he gave me a slender manila folder labeled Sunshine Gulag, containing about a dozen data sheets about new prison, California prison towns that had been filled out by students in a field course he ran at Southern California Institute of Architecture, SkyArk. His, his um, essay, Hell's Factories in the Field, a Prison Industrial Complex, picked up from Kerry McWilliams, and it seemed, on the surface of things, that the new prisons in rural California would only be welcome there. That was a possible initial analysis of those data sheets in that little folder. But to accept that without skepticism would be to ignore entire radical rural upheavals and previously existing organizational density that, for example, Deborah Weber, who Mike introduced me to uh, the same night I met, sweet night I met Alessandra in 1995, um, that Deborah Weber writes about so brilliantly in Dark Sweat, White Gold, or for models elsewhere that Emil Carr Cabral taught about in his lectures over the course of his short life or that Christina Heatherton takes up in her new book, Arise, or that Walter Rodney spelled out in lectures and books. The absence of that consideration made me wonder about taking the self-evident for evidence. I already knew this from organizing over many decades with many different kinds of people in party-based and less centrally structured organizations. But my suspicion, call it skepticism if you prefer, crystallized in thought because I learned as much from arguing with Mike as from reading or listening in giddy agreement with him. Not in order to recite a correct truth and discard an old catechism, but rather to turn the energy of bitter optimism to the consideration, as he so stunningly did in all of his writing, long form and short, 
of how objective conditions mix with consciousness, some retained from earlier struggles or reworked from one set of concerns to solve or endure new puzzles and challenges, produce fresh sights and scales of antagonistic struggle. These struggles are always, Mike taught us, for things that matter to people. Love, home, life, ability to move about, ability to stay put, peace. To matter as history's protagonists rather than cringe as history's victims. As writers influenced by and influencing Mike, such as Cindy Katz and Brown Ware, Titi Bhattacharya and Gargi Bhattacharya show in their work on everyday life and social reproduction. In short, Mike Davis showed what many other great thinkers of 20th century revolutionary movements also showed. And these are just examples. Lenin, Walter Rodney, CLR James, the Sri Lankans, SBD da Silva and GBS da Silva. And I thank uh, Kanishka Gunawardena for turning me on to them. Claudia Jones, Margaret Prescott, Angela Y. Davis, the comrade sisters of the Black Panther Party for self-defense, including those we might name, such as Erica Huggins, and those whose names we might know, but who, of whom they themselves or their loved ones continue to be aware, and whose names are slowly being gathered on a memorial wall and mural in Oakland, California. All of this work exemplifies what Mike so clearly and complexly understood. It is the substance of creative aggression which is at the end of the day and beginning of the next, what is necessary to achieve socialism for all. I specify socialism for all, not only in opposition to the organized abandonment by both capital and the anti-state state that is persistently ravaging so much of the overdeveloped world beset by inequality, but also in opposition to the police state socialism or police state social democracy currently advocated in that same world by hard and soft fascists whose intellectuals incubate in well-resourced hothouses, both right-wing and liberal, ranging from Harvard to Columbia to the University of Texas at Austin to the Manhattan Institute. And as an aside, there was a new journal, I forget the title of it, but somebody could look it up, that was born out of the 2020 uprisings founded at Harvard, Law and Equality, maybe it's called, that published an article in volume two arguing that more cops on USA streets would solve mass incarceration, which makes one wonder whether four cops presiding over George Floyd's murder might not have uh, presided over his murder had they numbered five or six or 10, because that is the logic of this kind of argument, we state socialism. In 1998, Mike got a MacArthur and I got a proper job. The Monday or Tuesday after the CR 98 conference, I gave a job talk at Berkeley. Mike came along with Alessandra, Angela, Gina Dent, Christian Parenti, the late great Rose Braz, Leslie De Benedetto, and others who rightly perceived the political dramatic character of a job talk event. And because Mike was by then a card-carrying genius, MacArthur having been conferred a few months prior, he was summoned by hand-wringing leftists on the faculty to give them talking points about me, uh, really to convince themselves not to convince the opponents who, the opponents to my appointment, who made it clear they had no beef with my scholarship, they just didn't like my politics. But the lefties were not sure what to think. One of the left opponents called my work, quote, Mike Davis light, a slam of which I pridefully boast. Mike, always already hard of hearing 25 years ago, thought the speaker had said Mike Davis like, and held forth passionately about how proud he was to be thus associated. When Mike's partner, Alessandra Moctezuma, firmly corrected the record, we all got quiet for a moment. Then we got mad but not for long because we were hungry. So then we laughed and went out to eat. The hammer, I'm getting to the end. That hammer. Mike actually asked me to bring a hammer from my house to the CR conference so he would have one on the stage. And I told you he was staying at the house and I forgot to get a hammer. In the flurry of conference organizing and driving up and down Shattuck Avenue, I forgot it. 
And by the time I remembered, it was too late to beg a facilities person to borrow one or send a comrade to a store to buy one. So Mike made something out of nothing. He made something from deficit in how he ended his talk that night. The absence didn't fluster him, even though he said backstage, he would never forgive me, let the transcript reflect laughter in my voice. Rather, in improvising, he made maybe a better conclusion than if he had wielded the red-handled hammer I requested for Christmas from my bemused mother-in-law in 1978. So let me close these remarks by sharing what burdens my heart today. Many have tuned in to listen to Angela, Jerry, and me talk about our beloved comrade and friend, Mike Davis. Some are aware of his enormous influences. Others only know the doom part and wonder what we three might have had to say. My heart is burdened by worry about what the curiosity might become. Every big event, a death, a riot, a pandemic, a war, summons the curious. That's a good thing. What Mike Davis exemplified was the urgency of persistence, which differs considerably from repetition. That is, while saying and saying again matters, I certainly do and don't we all, his constant engagement with, if you will, capitalism, nature, and socialism produced fresh understandings of articulations, again, connections and expressions, and therefore indicate modalities of struggle rather than spelled out particular battles, though he did that too. Mike was the first person in my adult life who called himself a geographer. And while I attribute becoming a card carrying geographer mostly to the wise intervention of my partner, Craig Gilmore, Mike's self description certainly resonated with, for me as I tried to figure out in the effort to transform my situation from lumpen professor to maybe pension bearing professor, what drama, my earlier calling, had to do with making the world anew. And then I realized everything. What we're up to is making the historical geography of the future, struggle by struggle, stretch sometimes across massive segments of the world's surface, sometimes less stretched, but always tentative and always hard. But why not as well full of the convivial joy that is too what we are fighting for, is it not? To get there, as we have learned from and with Mike Davis, we must act with creative aggression while remaining within our formations, convivial, no less than demanding. Mike Davis, presente. Thank you, Ruthie. I, we have a few minutes uh, at the end of this um, tribute to Mike for a little bit of conversation with Jerry and you, Ruthie. And um, certainly, if either of you uh, have questions or want to respond to each other's beautiful remarks, um, I want to allow time for that. Uh, but I did, Ruthie, want to ask you something about what you said um, about the question of geography. And, and one of the things that really struck me about Mike was that while being so resolutely internationalist and being able to call upon, to quote Raymond Williams, who you, I was so thrilled to hear you reference earlier, the resources of hope of international struggles, you know, just an encyclopedic knowledge of popular movements across the globe. I think there was something very distinct, and, and this also maybe, Jerry, you can speak to this too, in terms of his work in Los Angeles and Southern California. There was also something very just grounded about how Mike organized where he stood, um, and in particular sought to develop a socialism that could be relevant and germane in the United States and in Southern California and in Los Angeles and in the places where he was organizing. Um, so I would just, you know, love to hear your reflections on the ways that he balanced the kind of local and the regional and the national and the global. You're muted, I think. I, I broke my my wrist and I can barely move my hand to do things. Um, you know, grounded is the word. And I knew all of that, uh, you know, 
his internationalism, his encyclopedic knowledge. It's like Ruthie. I mean, they blow my mind. But to be so grounded as Ruthie is, that's what endeared him to me and people that knew him. And, you know, again, I the fact that that he looked at me as somebody to admire and to befriend, that was amazing to me. But he, he saw in me, I guess, what he's about. I fight. I was about to curse. I fight. And I will always do that. And I always have. And I think that's what, with all his intellect and all his knowledge, that's what he's trying to get us to do. But to understand what it is we're fighting so that we're not, you know, fighting the wrong enemy or trying to elect a good Democrat. You see, that's happening in L.A., y'all. Okay. Um. I totally, totally agree with what you what you were saying, Jerry. And the example that you gave of going um, to Georgiana Williams's house with um, with Mike um, and and Georgiana's uh, son, other son to talk about um, talk things over and to talk um, to talk about what was happening, for example, in Argentina with the mothers of the plaza. And you know where the the rock name came from, as I understand it, having learned from you, um, was from uh, mothers in South Africa. You 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 touch the mo mothers, you touched a rock. You will be crushed. Um, and these these uh, these implications of um, similar struggles in different places, it, with a, a less capacious um, uh, political imagination could just seem like, well, this is like this is like this. But rather, uh, what Mike encouraged all of us to do, whatever we were doing, and a, a lot of my early years with The Rock was just like organizing with The Rock. I didn't start organizing with The Rock so I could write about them. I wrote about them, it turned out, because it seemed like this would be something important for people to know about. But the organizing was before I went back to school or anything like that. Um, but what what we could see was how to think the um, the scale and scope of what was going on, both deeply in its local conditions, requirements, um, impediments, but also to think how it'd be possible to connect or conjoin that kind of struggle with a struggle elsewhere. So Mike's internationalism was not a comparative international relations type of internationalism. It was solidaristic always, um, and always solidaristic in the ways that, for example, he lays out in late Victorian holocausts, the then global um, character of um, capitalism producing premature death, right? So that we could then think about the possible um, international connections that could, and in many ways did, um, uh, resolve as international parties or international unions, or unions in solidarity with one another, um, or you know, things that other people have written about, like the non-aligned movement and um, the, the quote unquote third world um, movements that uh, did not survive the way the more radical um, proponents of building socialism that this was what the third way was. We're going to build socialism. We're going to build our own, and we're going to do it in solidarity with our comrades who are also fighting for colonial liberation, or in the case of the US and places such as that, to end racism and internal colonialism, all of that. Mike saw all of that. That was the character of his internationalism. And 
we have still, because he was so kind as to be a prolific writer, so much evidence for being able to think with him. Again, uh, I'm going to repeat something I said, I think, in my prepared remarks, not in order to come up with a new set of quotes to repeat to one another as though that solved things, but rather to think with him and then in looking out at the world that we're fighting like hell in now, to think with Mike and think with these other amazing thinkers, what would, what could we do that would be approaching a horizon of socialism, which I have been saying for a while is also the abolition horizon, which I think Angela would agree with, um, which is, again, as Angela said in her remarks, not just knocking down a building called a prison or even shutting down a court, but changing everything that contributes to the apparent necessity, inevitability, and naturalness of the prison and the court and the police. That's where we're at. And I think that's, that's where Mike's international imagination always circles through or cycles through whatever the more local, as you were saying, Anthony, in your question, or regional struggle might be. Well, I think that's such a beautiful place to end, Ruthie, because we all have work ahead of us to think with Mike. Um, to take the lessons um, from Mike's remarkable life and work into our own organizing. Um, and I just want to thank you and Jerry and Angela for helping illuminate some of the most vital themes that, that Mike's work and life uh, illuminate for us. Um, and the inspiration that we have to take from him into all the struggles ahead. And so, as everyone before has observed, Michael Ryan Davis, presente. We're forever grateful for your work and your contribution. Um, and we have our work cut out for us. Thank you so much.